Hello everyone. Welcome to another video of Final MBBS Surgery MCQ Points Discussion. In this video, we are going to discuss about mastitis. There are several entities which we are going to look at in this video. And at the end of this video, I will go through several multiple choice questions to show you how the questions can be asked in your exams. We will look at the pathology, lactational mastitis and non-lactational mastitis. So mastitis has two main clinical entities, lactational mastitis and non-lactational mastitis. There are few basic things which you need to know regarding mastitis. It is by definition inflammation of the breast tissue and it could be either infectious or non-infectious. So an infection may or may not be involved in mastitis. Then let's go through lactational mastitis. Regarding the etiology of lactational mastitis, so by the name you know this clinical entity occurs in breastfeeding mothers. So breastfeeding problems that cause prolonged engorgement of the breast or obstructed drainage of breast milk may predispose to lactational mastitis. And that too also either infectious or non-infectious. Regarding infectious Lactational mastitis, the most common organism involved is the Staphylococcus aureus. Then let's look at the clinical presentation of lactational mastitis. So in a breastfeeding mother, if she is presenting with a firm red tender swollen area of one breast associated with fever. So these are the features of acute inflammation. The patient's breast is firm, it is red, it is painful and tender and it is swollen and associated with fever as well. So then we can categorize the clinical entity as lactational mastitis. And also, other symptoms like myalgia, chills, malaise, and flu-like symptoms can occur in lactational. Lactational mastitis is most common in the first six weeks postpartum. You need to know these clinical features regarding the presentation of lactational mastitis. So, how can we evaluate a patient with lactational mastitis? There's a place for culture of the breast milk because with the antibiotic sensitivity pattern of the breast milk culture, we can narrow down the antibiotics. And is there a place for imaging? If lactational mastitis does not respond within 48 to 72 hours, to support your care and antibiotics, then yes, imaging can be considered. How a patient with lactational mastitis can be managed? For non-infectious lactational mastitis, to reduce pain, we can give non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and also ask the patient to do cold compresses. So these two measures we can do to reduce pain. And complete tainting of breast is advisable in these patients. It can be done by ongoing breastfeeding, so we need to ask the patient to continue breastfeeding or else 
breast pumping can be done and also hand expression. So those are the measures that we can do for non-infectious lactation and mastitis. How can we manage a patient with infectious lactation and mastitis? So we need to do all the measures used for non-infectious lactation and mastitis. To reduce pain, we can give NSAIDs and also ask the patient to do cold compresses and advise the patient regarding complete emptying of breast by continuing breastfeeding and also by breast pumping or hand expression and while continuing those measures we can start on an antibiotic in these patients. That antibiotic should cover the Staphylococcus aureus which is the most common organism. So we discussed about the etiology of lactation and mastitis, why it is caused, the organisms involved, the clinical presentation, evaluation and management of infectious and non-infectious lactation and mastitis. Next, let's go through non-lactation and mastitis. There are two main clinical entities which we know, need to know. The first one is periductal mastitis and the next one is granulomatous mastitis. So first let's go through periductal mastitis. Let's look at the pathology of periductal mastitis. Periductal mastitis is usually a chronic problem and there is inflammation of the subareolar ducts. The ducts beneath the areola get inflamed. Because of that, these patients usually present with periareolar inflammation. So there is inflammation around the areola. This is a picture of a breast of a patient with periductal mastitis. You can see the inflammation around the areola. So there is periareolar inflammation. Secondary infection of these inflamed ducts can also occur leading to duct damage and subsequent rupture of those ducts can result in periareolar abscess formation. So in periductal mastitis, periareolar abscess formation can also occur. So what are the organisms involved in formation of periareolar abscess? in patients with periductal mastitis. The most common organism is Staphylococci. Then other organisms such as Enterococci, Anaerobic, Streptococci, Bacterioids and Proteus can also involved in forming these periareolar abscesses. This picture shows a patient with periareolar abscess so you can see there is periareolar inflammation as well as a lumpy appearance areola area. So periareolar abscess formation is a known complication of periductal mastitis. And also after this abscess formation a draining fistula can be developed between a major subareolar duct and the skin. So these patients may present with discharging fistula to the skin of the periareolar area. So it is another complication of periductal mastitis. If you know the pathology of periductal mastitis, it is a chronic problem and there is inflammation of the subareolar ducts and patients presenting with periareolar inflammation and it can lead to periareolar abscess formation as well as fistula formation between a major subareolar duct and the skin. 
then if you suspect periductal mastitis in a patient so how can we manage that patient so the management includes obviously antibiotics then if there's a periarial abscess we can do needle aspiration or incision and drainage is there a place for ductal excision in patients with periductal mastitis in cases of repeated episodes of periareolar infection then yes ductal excision is one option for these patients so now you know the pathology and management of periductal mastitis mainly you need to know how to identify these patients so you can think about the pathology and clinical presentation to identify these patients the second clinical entity of non lactational mastitis which you need to know is granulomatous mastitis it is idiopathic granulomatous mastitis so let's look at the epidemiology of granulomatous mastitis it is commonly seen in paras young women so it occurs after childbirth but it can occur in nulliparous women as well and it is usually seen within a few years of pregnancy and there is no increased risk of breast carcinoma in patients with granulomatous mastitis what is the clinical presentation there are several facts you need to know these patients may present with solitary peripheral tender inflammatory breast mass so there can be a solitary breast mass as well which is tender and having features of inflammation and also there can be multiple simultaneous peripheral masses really there can be central masses as well but usually peripheral simultaneous masses with abscesses can be there and also sometimes there may be skin inflammation and ulceration this picture shows a patient with granulomatous mastitis so you can see the skin inflammation and ulceration over the skin in this patient and also nipple retraction may be there in patients with idiopathic granulomatous mastitis and also sinus formation body orange like changes and axillary adenopathy may also occur in these patients and over weeks to months these patients may develop repeated abscesses so now you can understand that there are several clinical presentations to the patients with idiopathic granulomatous mastitis there can be a solitary peripheral tender inflammatory mass and also there can be multiple simultaneous peripheral masses with abscesses there can be skin inflammation and ulceration and also the other features like nipple retraction sinus formation body orange like changes and axillary adenopathy may occur and also over weeks to months repeated abscess formation may be there in these patients how can we evaluate the patient with idiopathic granulomatous mastitis we need to do a core needle biopsy in these patients and in the biopsy specimen the pathologist will tell you that this patient is having granulomatous mastitis the management obviously we need to start on antibiotics in these patients and if there are any abscesses then drainage should be done so needle aspiration or else incision and drainage can be done 
to the expression. However, surgical excision is not advocated for patients with granulomatous mastitis because slow wound healing can be there. So that is the management of granulomatous mastitis. Now, now you know few facts about the epidemiology of granulomatous mastitis and the clinical presentation of these patients. There are several clinical presentations and in the evaluation that you need to know a core biopsy to diagnose these patients and the management. So in the management, if there is any abscess, we can drain those abscesses and you can start the patient with antibiotics and the surgical excision is not advocated for these patients. So in this video we discuss about the pathology of mastitis, few basic points and we went through the lactational mastitis and non-lactational mastitis. So I advise you to go through again with this video and if possible make a note then you will better remember these facts. So now let's go through a few questions to understand this on mastitis. This is a true false type of question. So you need to select whether each of these statements are true or false. So let's look at the statement A. So it asks regarding mastitis. Acute mastitis needs incision and drainage. So according to uh, this statement, acute mastitis in the management we mainly mentioned about the measures to reduce pain and also we should encourage the patient to empty the breast and also uh, we should start the patient if it is infectious mastitis with antibiotics and if there is no abscess formation there is no place for incision and drainage. So, a is false and the statement B says can cause nipple retraction yes mastitis can cause nipple retraction the statement B is true the statement C mentions chronic granulomatous mastitis presents with recurrent best abscesses that you learn as a fact in this video formation of recurrent breast abscesses over weeks to months is a known complication of granulomatous mastitis. So granulomatous mastitis is a chronic process and there are several clinical presentations. You go back through the video and listen to those and try, try to remember. So the statement C is true. And the statement D mentions periductal mastitis can cause nipple discharges. It is also true because you learn that periductal mastitis can cause periareolar abscess and then sinus formation between the major subareolar ducts and the skin. So with those sinuses, nipple discharges can occur. So D is also true. Then uh, the statement D mentions most commonly caused by Staphylococcus aureus that you know as a fact. Staphylococcus aureus is the most common organism causing mastitis. So now you know how to answer the multiple choice questions. For that you need to know the core theory knowledge which I mentioned in the video. So go through this video again and refresh your knowledge.